Greetings. Greetings, everyone. Greetings. Nice to see the room, mostly full. And uh, greetings to everyone at home online. Lovely to have you along for this uh, December meeting. And as it's the last meeting of the year, last uh, meeting of the year, it's also the we're heading towards the end of the last quarter of the year. So I think it would be a, a good time to have a wander through the financial markets and uh, see where we are and see where we might be headed. I'm going to give me a little dongle to work. Just give me a second. Okay, we're going to have to go manual. Uh, no, the, the the following analysis is uh, purely general in nature. Nothing that you're about to see or hear is a recommendation to buy or finance, uh, buy or sell any financial instrument. Please do your own research, do your own homework, and make your own decisions. I always like to start with a quote this time. It comes from Jesse Livermore, who says, the obvious rarely happens, the unexpected constantly happens. And that's certainly true for financial markets in general. Uh, but as we'll see in a moment, particularly true, I think anyway, for the US mar uh, stock market, which has been constantly surprising us to the upside, uh, despite all the uh, stories of it, uh, people thinking it's about to fall into oblivion. So as it's the last one of the year, I always like to also have a look at the very, very long-term view of the markets. Uh, so this is the Dow Jones going all the way back to 1900. And you can see it's very much characterized by these sort of long sideways drifts that it goes through, and then these periodic move up or these trending moves between those various consolidation areas. And we certainly looks like we're in the third one of these since 1900 at the moment. And you can see that we've done about 500% or so since the bottom of 2009. So that's more or less a third of what those other two large legs have produced, meaning that if we are truly in one of those similar type trending moves, then we could have really uh, quite a long way to go, basically twice as much as we've come already from uh, the bottom of 2009. It's also interesting to look at what previously we would have called devastating crashes, such as the um, uh, Black Monday crash of 1987, which is marked there in that blue circle, uh, and then the 2020 COVID crash, which is this one here, So, which looks... Uh, Looks small by comparison, although I grant you it is a logarithmic chart, but um, it just shows you how this market, if it continues to produce upside, it can look make previously what we're counting as large corrections actually look quite small by comparison. Uh, I'm just going to adjust my Zoom settings so that they're not all over my screen. Okay, so drilling down into the uh, monthly uh chart next this is also on a log scale here but you can see that since 2009 is where, where this uh, low is down at the bottom here uh, it is produced a, a very nice uh, well-behaved uptrend with lower volatility than we had through the uh, 2008 correction and where we're sitting right now is bang in the middle of the trend and the all-time high is not very far away at all and we can see that if we zoom into the weekly chart here you can see that uh, we had that kind of uh, bull flag uh, type of pattern, I guess you would call it. Then the breakout there at the uh, start of this year. And since then, we've corrected and then we've produced another uh, large move to the upside, which looks like it's in uh, danger of breaking the uh, the previous high. And once again, those all-time highs up at 4,800 are not too far away at all. So, um you know, if I were a bet man, I'd say this looks like a very bullish market and which we, it probably won't be too long at all before we see uh, another all-time high. On the Ichimoku chart, we can see that we're, we're above the cloud with both the uh, the price and what's called the Chico span or the lagging line, that green line that's uh, 26 weeks behind the price there. Uh, so that tells us we're in bullish territory. There's no question about that. Uh, and uh, once again, I think the market probably has got more chance of moving higher than lower at this point. But if it does move lower, the clouds will tend to provide support in that area, which at the moment uh, is sitting around about 4,200 to 4,400. So let's look, uh, look, let's look under the bonnet, as it were, and see if uh, the market is holding up in terms of its fundamentals. Uh, first one to, we like to look at is the bullish percent index, which looks at the percentage of uh, stocks in the S&P 500 that are quote-unquote bullish. It uses point and figure behind the scenes to try and determine that. 
Uh, but we can see there that uh, there's 70 percent of stocks in the s p 500 that are currently bullish that that's that's a that's a good healthy number on the face of it uh, the only question mark i would have is we do have what what you might class as uh, type c divergence there where we've got the, the market moving sideways this is the s p 500 at the bottom of that chart uh, whereas we've got the bullish percent index starting to look like it wants to make a lower high it's obviously still rising, so we can't see that for definite now. But it's interesting if you look back to what happened in 2021 there, where the market was rising and the bullish percent index uh, starts diverging lower. And that tends to happen as you move in towards these um, swing highs in the market because the uh, the participation will tend to fall, meaning it's a small number of large stocks that tend to drag the market up. And there's no question we're seeing that at the moment with the FANG stocks and the large growth stocks, uh, AI being one of the big stories of 2023. Those sort of six or seven stocks are the ones that are pulling the market up. And, you know, if the, the S&P 4 Nine three, as they're calling calling them, uh, are, are basically more or less flat or down for the year as a group. Uh, so that does mean the participation will fall, and you'll see lower and lower prints on this. Doesn't mean the market is going to correct, as you can see there back in 2021. It took basically a whole year of divergence before the market actually uh, reacted. So. It's just something to be aware of, maybe an early sign of the development of this uptrend. If we look at the uh, stocks above their 200-day moving average there, you can see that uh, it's a lower number here, only about 60%. Again, speaking to that that drop in participation as the market moves higher. And the divergence here is a little bit more pronounced with the market rising and the uh, uh, number of stocks above their 200-day moving average falling uh, over time. So we'll see if that continues. It certainly doesn't uh, rule out the market making a new all-time high. It can certainly go on and do that with uh, lower participation. But once again, it's just something to, to keep on your radar and keep an eye on as time moves on. Uh, discretionary versus staples is something that is often a leading indicator of uh, the broader market. Uh, you know, if people are feeling more sanguine about economic times, they're more likely to spend on discretionary items. That's going to put dis push discretionary stocks up versus staples, your supermarkets, and so on. Uh, and you can see here that they're, that ratio versus the market are both in line with each other. They're both moving up together, making higher highs and higher lows. So that's certainly positive for the market. Once again, it's a leading indicator. You can see it's making new highs. Uh, so you know there's a good chance that that will play out in the market, and we will see an all-time high once again in the S&P in the next, um, let's call it, uh, three to six months. The advanced decline uh, line uh, measures the number of advancers versus um, uh, decliners in the market, and uh, it accumulates. So you would uh, so it you would hope that it would be in line with the market, and that's certainly what it looks like at the moment. It's below its highs, but it's starting to rise again, and that's per that's perfectly in line with what the market's uh, doing as well. So once again, that uh, that's that's uh, good news for the market that they are, those two are not divergence. We would like to see the the AD line make a new high, and that would hopefully drag the the market up. Uh, but that's uh, we're not there yet. But if we look at the the, uh, the the difference in performance over this year between the three big indexes in the U.S., the Nasdaq, the S&P, and the Russell, we can see it's really a story of three different markets. Uh, the Nasdaq 100 there is uh, up a whopping 44% for 2023, which is just a massive number. Um, and obviously, that's been the big story this year. It's been the, the story of the big tech growth stocks, uh, AI being obviously the, the the narrative that the market has been uh, dealing with this year. And that's been pushing up the tech-heavy Nasdaq 100. Uh, the so 2000, meanwhile, which is the sort of the, the, the small caps, uh, has really been um, struggling and is up only around 6% uh, for the year. And given the S&P 500 is a mix of the both, uh, you would expect that it's in the middle there. But it's still up uh, around about 18% for the year, which is more than double what you would expect for an average uh, S&P 500 year. So, so it really has been a really very good year for the uh, US stock market, uh, certainly. And... Um, 
uh, you know, the, the the big question, I guess, is will that growth story continue into um, into 2024 and uh, continue to uh, to pull the broader market up? Like I said, the S and P 500 without those top seven stocks is basically flat for the year. So that gives you some sense of uh, of how much influence those have. Uh, swinging now to the yield curve, and the red line there shows you where the yield curve is now, which is still in that sort of inverted shape. The, the shadow lines sh there, though, show you where it has been. So you can see there has been a, a gradual fall in um, yields, bond yields across the board, but your treasury bond yields, that is, across the board. But uh, what you can see from the shadow lines is the long end of the curve, the right-hand side of the curve, is actually falling faster than the short end of the curve, which is barely budged. So while that... Um, so that means that we're still in that inversion, although the inversion is not quite as uh, as steep as it once was. Um, so what does that mean? Well, if we look at that um, one part of that curve, so this compares the 10-year to the two-year spread, the yield, that is, um, as, a, as a just one divided by the other, you can see here that the uh, as that as the line is falling there through 21 and 22, that was the yield curve slowly going from being a normal shape to, to being inverted. The blue line there is a zero line, so that's where the yield curve is flat. So you can see it then became quite inverted. But what's happened in the last sort of six months or so is that the yield curve, the, the yield curve has become less inverted. It's not become positive because it's still below the blue line there, but it's come become less inverted. And that means that there is um a little bit more um uh People are, again, again, maybe a little bit more sanguine about uh, economic prospects going forward. And that also means the yield curve inversion is very indicative normally of a, a coming recession in the next 12 to 18 months. And because the yield curve is losing some of that uh, the steepness, uh, the uh, probability of a U.S. recession has actually fallen from almost 70 percent down to about 46 percent in the next 12 months. So that's uh, that's an interesting thing to look at. Uh, if we move on to the sentiment indicators now, the put call ratio uh, is a good one to watch. Uh, measures the ratio of uh, uh, puts to calls in the market. It basically is um, it inversely correlated to the 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 index itself. So uh, as this as this rises, that tends to mean the market's falling, and vice versa. Uh, but what 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 tends to happen is that when it gets to one of those two extremes, then it will tend to rever um, it will tend to reverse. Uh, and you can see at the moment we're actually more or less in the middle there. It has been quite high, so that was during that corrective phase we saw in the last few months. But now we've come out of that. The put call curve, uh, put call ratio is starting to fall, which means that we are um, uh, not really at any risk of being at an extreme one way or the other in terms of highs or lows. The volatility index, or the VIX, is another interesting one to watch in terms of its sentiment. And what's interesting here was is is perfectly um, uh, it's perfectly normal to consider that the VIX should be low, considering the market is going uh, up. Uh, but what's interesting is that it's so low, uh, and it's not so low on a on a uh, on a very long term basis, but it is quite low in the last uh, few few years, as you can see there. This chart covers about three or so years, and you can see during the last upswing that we had through 2021, the VIX never really got that low, which meant there was still a reasonable amount of uh, fear and hedging in the market through that period, um, which you know, as as turned out, was justified because 2022 was uh, was a uh, poor year for the stock market. But now we're seeing the VIX actually falling, which means um, the, the reason for that is that it means there's less demand for uh, VIX futures and S&P 500 options. That means that there's less hedging going on from the institutional players, particularly the portfolio managers, meaning that there is an expectation that the stock market is more likely to rise than fall over the near term. And once again, that's another reason to believe that the uh, all-time high might be at risk uh, in the coming months. On to the seasonality, and the, it, it, we're almost at the end of the year, so I think we can say this has pretty much been a, a match. Uh, we have that uh, upswing through the first part of the year, the the, so, the northern summer doldrums where the market tends to go sideways, and then we've got the so-called Santa Claus rally in towards the end of the year. 
Uh, and so it's it's been a more or less a, a a perfect match for the the what we would expect to happen in a normal uh, S and P five hundred year. On the presidential election cycle, which is uh, which actually tracks the Dow around the S and P five hundred, it's also been more or less a match as well. You can see there the the trend up through the so first two thirds of the year, the correction down into November, and then the Santa Claus rally up towards the end of the year. And again, once again, that's been on, uh, near enough a perfect uh, match for that cycle. So um, so always good to um, always wise to keep your eye on what the cycles are doing. Uh, on Calvert Clark's pressure chart for 2023, he had December as the strongest month of the year, and that seems to be uh, playing out so far. Uh, this, uh, in the, well, I mean, we're only into the first week, so we can't really say that for certain. But, um, but given the strength of the market, it seems to be showing on a short-term basis. Um, I certainly wouldn't be uh, too surprised if uh, December turns out to be the strongest uh, month of, uh, by the end of it. And on the covers decade pressure cycle chart, year three is uh, is one of the better up years, and you know certainly that that has, that has played out. It's been an outstanding year for the U.S. stock market, uh, and we move into year four, which uh, which doesn't tend to be quite as strong uh, on his analysis, um, and you know based on some other cycles as well, year four tends to be uh, much more of a sideways type of year. So. It uh, will be interesting to see if that plays out. Um, when we when I do the next one of these, I do one of these every quarter. So when we do the next one, we'll be into a new presidential year, which is the presidential election year. So we'll be able to have a look and see how that plays out. Swinging over to the Aussie stock market now and the monthly chart. And we're having to chat about this uh, before uh, the talk here. And you can see how close we are still to those 2007 highs. The um, the the ASX 200 has been languishing uh, compared to its U.S. counterpart. There's no question about that. Certainly, it suffers from not having those big uh, tech growth stocks in it that's, uh, that's been powering the U.S. stock market. Uh, but it's very much uh, sideways, as you can see there. Broke through the 2007 high a couple of years ago, but it's basically gone nowhere since it's just bouncing around in that area if we zoom into the weekly chart we can see it's kind of stuck in that range between about 68.50 and 78.30 as i've got it marked there and anytime it reaches one of those two extremes it seems to uh, find buyers or sellers and reverses back towards the middle of the pattern so um, I, I can't see any resolution on the horizon for this market it just seems to want to uh, uh, go nowhere fast if we compare its, years, its performance on the year to a few of the other Asian and U.S. markets there, you can see it's more or less been in line with what Shanghai did. Hang Seng has done the worst. Uh, I've stuck the Indian Nifty 50 in there, uh, which has done reasonably well at uh, around about 12%. Then you've got the S&P up about 18 as we've seen. But the, the winner, certainly in uh, our time zone, has been the Japanese Nikkei, which has done about 24% for the year. So uh, outstanding. Uh, there for uh, the Japanese market. On to the currencies, and the US dollar uh, has uh, held for now above that 103 level. You can see it got up about 115 or 118, I think it was. It's pulled back, but it's still holding above that 103, 104 level. Uh, the big question will be, you know, if we start to see uh, rate reductions, uh, the federal Fed funds rate reduction in the new year, which uh, seems to be the the, the um, smart money at the moment. Maybe they start cutting early part of uh, 2024. Whether that uh, impacts on the currency, uh, the uh, U.S. dollar is uh, benefiting a lot from the so-called carry trade. They've got one of the highest interest rates in the world of developed economies. So uh, a lot of money is flowing into uh, US dollar to take advantage of that. And that's uh, uh, flowing out of the other currencies. In particular, our own uh, Aussie dollar here has been suffering uh, for quite a while. In fact, uh, 2019, 20, 2020, let's call it, was its uh, last attempt at that 80 cents uh, level. And it's just been kind of dribbling down ever since then. Anytime it tries to uh, poke its head up, it finds sellers and down it goes again. Uh, so it's very much caught up on that carry trade. Now, I would not be surprised if uh, we see a revisit of that 60 cent mark. Um, 
sometime next year, let's call it. Euro is kind of in the same boat. Uh, it's kind of moving a little bit more sideways. It's basically a mirror image of the US dollar. Those two are the, the biggest trading partners uh, in the world. and uh, But it does seem to be coming towards a crunch point. You can see that uh, downtrend line and the 105 level uh, are both coming in to meet each other. So it has to resolve one way or another uh, across one of those lines, even if it just drifts uh, more sideways. Uh, and that will be the telling. Uh, that that uh, downtrend line, as you can see, has been in place for a very, very long time. So if we were to break that to the upside, that would be uh, significant. And of course, below it, we've got parity, which it did duck down below uh, just briefly um, a few months back. So that's that's kind of a floor for it. So again, if it, if it broke to the downside, that would also be significant so keep your eye on the euro uh, the yen the yen is kind of the biggest carry trade in the world because their um their interest rate is basically zero or more negative so if you can get five percent in the us and uh, zero percent in J japan which way is the money going to flow and you can see that perfectly well in this chart here as it just kind of dribbles down uh it's been a couple of years i think since it broke through that um 0 0.008 yen to the dollar there and it uh, just uh, there doesn't seem to be a floor in the yen uh, as far as I can see. Uh, but the one bucking the trend is uh, not a nation state, but uh, good old Bitcoin, which has just taken off like a rocket in the last few months. Uh, the 20K did dip below that 20K. So briefly, this is a weekly chart. And um, then it managed to get back above that. It looks like it was a uh, well, let's call it a bear trap there. Um, and then it sort of dribbled around under the 30K mark. And now it's got above that. It's just off to the races and running. And I can, really can't pick out any sort of meaningful levels of resistance. Maybe the 40, maybe the 50K mark, it might have a rest, given it's a big round number. Um, it's starting to look extended to the upside, maybe even overbought. But um, I certainly wouldn't be the one one to stand in the way of um, uh, Bitcoin making more upside. Uh, you can see how it's behaved in the past, this thing. It just goes up and down like a, like a yo-yo. Uh, so it's uh, very strong at the moment for Bitcoin. And rounding off on the commodities, uh, crude oil is the big story, I guess. Very, very weak at the moment. Uh, got uh, above that 85 level for what... It turned out to be just a few weeks, and you can see it's turned out to be a bull trap this time for the uh, for the buyers of crude. Now it's back below there. It's actually made quite a quick move down to uh, towards that sixty three level. I certainly wouldn't be surprised if it gets there in the next few weeks, and then we'll see if uh, sixty three uh, uh, manages to hold or whether uh, we see further downside from uh, crude oil. Gold, uh, so we were talking about gold earlier, that uh, it looks great on a point and figure chart because it's just gone nowhere. <laughs> um, and you can see it's very much stuck once again, a bit like the Aussie market, it's stuck in that zone uh, between, um, sorry, I don't have my glasses on to see the screen here, between 1620 and 2080 is the uh, range for gold. So, uh, so it's just wobbling around in there. Interestingly, this month, which is that last candle there, we're only a week into the month, but you can see it's pierced that uh, that up uh, that that top uh, resistance area, but uh, it quickly finds sellers and and they've uh, they've kicked it back into the pattern. So it'll be interesting to see where that ends up at the end of the month and whether we back down into the pattern or whether it can actually uh, mount a, a breakout from here. On copper, uh, nothing to write home about copper. Really, it's uh, it, it sort of blasted through the uh, the top level there, four sixty five, but it sort of dribbled back down, and it's kind of just been stuck in that range between the sort of mid fours and mid threes uh, since then. So copper is obviously a massive story for the 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 green uh, the green revolution and uh, green tech and so on. So I'm no doubt, uh, I've got no doubt it's got a big, big future. But in the short term, uh, I think it's uh, suffering a little bit from oversupply. And lastly, on iron ore, well, iron ore has actually made a little bit of a breakout. Uh, you can just see it there, that last candle there. 130 was the resistance level. It's managed to uh, get over there, uh, although, to be fair, we're not at the end of the week yet. So, <laughs> so that could all change. But uh, if it manages to hold above 130 for uh, two or three weeks, I think there's, uh, there's a chance it may go higher. And 160 would be uh, the, the target, I think, uh, on the upside for iron ore.
So just to summarize that, uh, U.S. stocks are looking very bullish for my money and uh, heading towards that all-time high once again. The Aussie 200 uh, going nowhere fast. It's the, it's the train to sideways at the moment. Uh, on the currencies, it's very much the story of the strong U.S. dollar with uh, with those interest rates and the the big massive carry trade that's um, that's basically beaten up all the other major currencies. And on the commodities, uh, I guess the summary would be oil weak and gold gold very bullish. You can always reach me if you want to uh, send me a note or ask me a question. That's my details there. Follow me on Twitter at Helix Trader. Uh, otherwise, I wish you all the best for 2024. Have a good, uh, good luck, good trading, and bye for now. Thank you.